So my name is Theodosia Orlando. Uh, I guess you can call me Theta or Theo for short. Yeah, so I wasn't particularly like a worldly creature. I was a very dreamy kid. Education was extremely important to both of my parents. And my mother eventually did go to school when I was older and became a nurse, you know, and part of that, yeah, was to fund my brother and I's private education. So for the most part, yeah, for the majority of my, you know, kind of even primary and secondary education, like, yes, at this academy until eighth grade. And this is where, like, this new teacher shows up. So this teacher, okay, she's younger. She's, uh, she's definitely kind of understood to be, you know, she's like the, she's like the cool teacher. And so she almost sort of, like, turned herself into kind of this savior figure. All right, and then we started spending a lot of time together. It was kind of being concocted as a very romantic thing. I'm still 13, you know, it's like, please. And I'm still, again, I don't, I don't know how the world works. Like, I don't even know what sex abuse is. So that's even part of why, like, I didn't quite recognize it. And I was reading a book of case studies uh, of abuse. And there was something about reading those case studies that I was like, wait a minute. What I'm reading is a little hard to separate from what I'm experiencing. But eventually, like, one day I was like, maybe it's time to tell the dean. And so I just remember, like, walking into his office and just, like, telling him, you know, just, like, disclosing it. And I remember him being so nervous. And I even remember being stunned at that, that, like, this is interesting that this information makes an adult so nervous. Like, I didn't have any, I didn't know quite why. Because the other thing is, it's like, even an idea that it was, like, a crime that was taken really seriously, I, I don't, I did not fully understand that at all. Yeah, but any attempt of people to get any kind of like psychological care backfired immensely. I'm 19 and I have this boyfriend. This other man shows up. And indeed, like I almost, like, I mean, I did it. Like, I ended up falling in love with this other man and what have you, even though I had permission by my boyfriend at the time to be with him. Boyfriend gets mad about it. And it proceeds to essentially like use violence in a very calculated, a very sadistic way where it was very premeditated. It wasn't even just like beating me up purely as a crime of passion. It was like, it was a strategy. Yeah, like a week later, here he is like taking pictures of me like in lingerie with my bruises and like, we're not gonna call this domestic violence. We're just, we're gonna turn this, if you will, into sort of a kinky erotic thing. So like I, I carried around the belief that like if consent doesn't exist, then I cannot be violated. I was just so conditioned to it, again, to the point where it was not only my normal, but my home, and then, um, yeah, almost my sanctuary, if you will. And it was such a counterfeit sanctuary. I had seen, like, even, like, another local ad for, like, this local bondage producer. And I had, like, seen that work, and it freaked me out. But there was something even, if you will, like about that, that fear of it and how it was completely different even than like anything I had like previously experienced. It was different. I didn't feel so, shall we say, like commodified right off the bat. I had met this local girl. She was a local dominatrix. And she just sort of like really sat me down and was just like, you need to understand like the world you're going into, you are essentially going into like a tyrant's lair. What really, really mattered in the bondage world at the time was how well you could suffer. That's why even like some girls that maybe were a little less like conventionally attractive, it's like if they could take a lot of pain and a lot of abuse on camera, they were way more valuable. They want the suffering. And there was even something about financial extortion that took place where like even though I really didn't want to do porn anymore, like those last few shoots that I did, I had to do them like just for the money. So I think that yeah, like one thing that was definitely drilled into me is that again like that suffering well was my primary talent, all right? That narrative had to start to be deconstructed. There was something about that. There was even something, shall we say, about like me finally understanding like the reality of abuse as a child, where all of a sudden it's like, it's almost like my tolerance, if you will, for shall we say predatory people or grooming behavior, or again, like seeing people in more gentle, like denying yeah, their criminal activity. 
like I, I just I just lost like it's, it's almost like the tolerance dissolved overnight and like all of a sudden it's like I couldn't even stomach that kind of darkness or being around it. Are you happy? Oh gosh, am I happy? I, I like joy more than happy. Happy is a little capricious. I would say joy is a much more trustworthy and constant state. And I think it does feel a little bit like winning the lottery of life, but not just by pure chance also, but, but also like indeed like starting to make the right decisions for once. What a novel idea. So yeah, like I, yeah, and, and yeah, joyful. I'm very fulfilled and, and joyful.